Uh, my name is Colin Crow McAdams. I work here in the Orchard at Seed Savers Exchange with Dan Bussey, who's our orchard manager. Uh, he's from Edgerton, Wisconsin, and has a orchard of some 300 varieties. Is that right, Dan? Yep. Yeah, on four acres, and uh, run a commercial cider press that I make uh, blends of cider for sweet and hard use. And Dan's been our orchard advisor for about 15 years here at Seed Savers Exchange, and he's been writing a book that chronicles all of the known varieties in North America since 1623, which is up to some 15,000, and I don't even know how many pages. Uh, lots. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we're going to talk to you today about grafting and a little bit just about uh, Seed Savers and our mission and the orchard to start with. So uh, Seed Savers Exchange is a nonprofit organization dedicated to uh, preserving uh, North America's diverse uh, but endangered garden crops. And so as part of that, you know, mostly that's open pollinated heirloom seed varieties that our members send us and that we acquire. Um, but as part of that, we have an orchard of some 550 heirloom or heritage apple varieties, I should say, um, which means that they're mostly varieties that date to pre-1900 is our criteria. Um, sort of looking at things that were popular and around before uh, uh, refrigerated boxcars sort of changed the game. Um, things that you know people would used to use for you know cooking or storage or you know ciders and stuff. Um, so uh, our orchard here has around 550 different varieties at the moment. Um, we're in the process of establishing a new orchard, um, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But this is a map of our current orchard. Um, it's about 12 acres fenced from the deer, and we have a lot of a lot of very different varieties here. Um, this is a pretty diverse collection and we're looking at expanding it all the time. So I'll let Dan tell you a little bit about some of the varieties that we do have in our orchard. Okay, the first variety that you see there is the uh, black gilliflower. As you can see, it has a resemblance to the delicious and it's possible that it may be a parent uh, of it uh, along with the Shenango strawberry, which is also very similar. It dates back to the uh, mid-1700s from Connecticut and it has a very unique oblong conical shape. Slightly ribbed, it can get very dark in color, and it's a, it's a really pretty apple, and it's a really wonderful one for eating and blending into cider. Next one we've got is Early Joe, which is, uh, came from about 1800 from Heman Chapin, who was the man who raised it from New York State. He planted seeds in his orchard, and one of the seedlings was uh, Early Joe. Um, the, the name Early Joe kind of came about because uh, there was a, a man who was stealing apples from his orchard and he carved the uh, word Early Joe in, in his, on his trees um, when they were growing just to kind of ward him off and uh, it was kind of interesting. It became popular around in the mid-1840s and uh, it was a very well-liked apple and it was grown quite a bit to, uh, to some extent in the south. And if we did that around here, we'd rename most of the trees Early Colin. <laughs> That's for sure. This one is the Ortley. It, this apple came from the orchard of Michael Ortley of New Jersey. It was first described in about 1817 under the name Woolman's Long Pippin, and which was uh, an abolish preacher by that name. Uh, in about 1825, it was renamed to Ortley as the man who originated it. It's a very pretty long apple and uh, beautiful golden color. And this one is Lady. Lady is a very early apple from France. It dates back to the 1600s and it's also known as Palme d'Api. It was a nice little apple to be able to carry in a lady's pocket. It was very aromatic and it's a very attractive apple. We had a tremendous crop on this tree in our orchard last year and it's just covered with these little palm sized apples. It's very pretty. And the next one we've got is uh, Swayze. Um, Colonel Swayze found this apple growing in the wild. Um, around 1854. He had a farm a couple of miles away from Niagara Falls where he found it. And it was originally named the Swayze Palm Grease, which is a French apple. And in the 1800s, a barrel of these apples could fetch up to five pounds sterlings on the English market. And it uh, has, it's known to keep till spring and it has a very rich, distinctive uh, russet type flavor. Yeah, this is one of many uh, russet apples, which aren't uh, commonly seen anymore because their skin starts out russeted like a potato, which almost makes it look like it has scab, and that's something that people are trying to avoid. Uh, but the russet apples have a very distinct flavor, and they're used a lot for cider and different things. Yeah, typically apples like uh, um, uh, golden russet and Roxbury russet have a very full flavor. It's very balanced with sugars and acid, and it uh, makes sometimes the best single blend uh, uh, or single varietal ciders. Single blend, that makes no <laughs> sense. Anyways, um, russets by and large are very interesting apples. They're not always really wonderful eating, but by and large they are quite, quite unique and quite good. 
whenever people, you know, people always ask, you know, what's your favorite apple? And, you know, the, the answer is invariably, you know, depending on what you want to do with it and, you know, what time of the year because, you know, the right apple on the right day. But I have to say this is probably my favorite apple in our orchard. And this is the uh, Gloria Mundi? Yes. Yeah, that is a huge apple. What do I have down here for that? Oh, oh, there we are. <clears throat> it means glory of the world. Uh, it's a name quite fitting to this apple. It can grow to three and a half pounds. The original tree may have grown before 1800 on the farm of a Mr. Crooks near Red Hook, New York, but it's also been credited to Long Island. Many times apple histories are long confused one place or another. They get uh, found and moved, and uh, so the original source sometimes is quite hard to trace down. It's quite prized for making apple butter and mostly used for cooking because of its weight. An old catalog used to warn that a blow from such a falling of a meteor would cause no light casualty. <laughs> it is a huge apple. Swar. Okay. The swar is a large greenish apple. This pic picture looks uh, particularly yellowish, but typically it's more of a green color. It was introduced by the Dutch who settled in New York City. Swar is low Dutch, meaning heavy, as it is a large green heavy apple and great for cooking. I've grown it for many years, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an amazingly dense apple. As Dan was pointing out, this is typically a green apple, and the fact that it's yellow in this picture uh, highlights one of the sort of key problems in trying to identify apples. You know, they're known by different names in different places, and even where they're grown can have an effect on their color and sort of character. In this, this case, it's probably just a much more ripe version of the apple that was you know, uh, drawn by the artist at the time, but we frequently get people asking us questions, you know, can you identify this apple? Um, almost invariably it's red and stripy, you know, greeny stripy, and it's so even, even with a, you know, a good description, some apples are very distinct in their flavor, some are very distinct in their color, but there's this tremendous variation even based on location. Yeah, the picture of this uh, was, was painted in March, um, so that would have been kept for a very long time and certainly would certainly yellow up compared to the green when you first would pick it back in uh, October into November. This is the golden russet. It's another one of the russet apples and another good cider variety. Golden russet originated in upstate New York. There are several varieties by the name gold russet. This one is the one that is from western New York, uh, different from the one that uh, has the same name but is from Massachusetts. It is very similar to the English gold russet, and there's some confusion as to whether it may be one and the same. Uh, typically, it is prized for its very rich sugary juice and makes excellent cider, and it's a great keeper. It stores well into spring. Um, since storage techniques have changed the way they are, this storage apples have fallen somewhat out of flavor, but it, it is one of the best eating apples that I know of, and it makes tremendous cider. And so that just gives you, you know, sort of a, a general idea of, you know, some of the tremendous the diversity that's out there, you know, in this, you know, with 550 varieties we have, and, you know, maybe 15,000 name varieties that may have existed, you know, versus maybe the sort of yellow, red, and green that you might find at the supermarket. So this is a graphic I had come up with at one point um, showing the parentage of some of the common apples at the supermarket. And uh, the size of any particular apple shows its market share uh, of U.S. production. So you can see Red Delicious down in the corner taking up about a quarter of total U.S. production. But if you follow the lines, um, the, arrows, the arrows point towards uh, the children. So. Red Delicious is a parent of Fuji. Uh, the other parent is unknown. It's not the only parent, um, obviously. Um, but then you can see where you know Cameo is the meeting of Golden Delicious and Red Delicious. Uh, Red Delicious is a you know a parent of Kids Orange Red, which is a parent of Gala. You know, so by a couple of steps, you know Red Delicious is related to you know two, three of the sort of the major crop apples, and and a lot of them are interrelated. You know, a lot of if you look at the size, you know, and then if you look. In the corner, there's one that says all others, you know, and that's sort of about 8% of the crop. Um, there are some of these varieties that are still grown, you know, Rhode Island Greening is a classic apple, Macintosh is older, um, well, even Red Delicious itself is an older apple, but uh, it's been sort of selected uh, over time uh, through different strains to be the apple that it is today, as opposed to the Hawkeye Delicious, uh, which is one that we have in our orchard. Yes, the original Delicious was a striped apple. I don't think any people have seen too many striped Delicious uh, apples in the store. Yeah, and so uh, one thing, you know, as we get into sort of, you know, why we graft and, you know, how, how apples are propagated, which is sort of the next portion, um, apples are prone to bud mutation. And so a single bud in this, in this process of grafting, uh, one single bud uh, on a tree can be slightly different, you know, from the rest. Therefore, you know, one branch would be slightly different, you know. So I, I've seen on a tree 
uh, where on a, a, a tree of russet apples, one branch, all of the apples had no russet. Um, it's kind of an amazing thing to see. It was a very startling example of that. But in the case of Red Delicious, you know, if, if they're growing millions of these trees, if someone sees a branch that has, you know, much more red and conical apples, which is what they're looking for, then they would graft that one and then make grafts from there, therefore sort of selecting for that, that type of apple without actually doing any breeding. Um, so uh, one thing we'd like to mention for a moment is, you know, we have that our old orchard, and this year uh, Dan and I are working on establishing a new orchard here at Seed Savers Exchange at Heritage Farm. Um, it's about nine and a half acres fenced in. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, to show off basically a lot of the range of apple diversity and also many of the things you can do with apples. So you'll see on the sides of this uh, graphic there are different pruning types, you know, spindle, modified scaffold, open scaffold, vase. Uh, you'll see some espalier designs um, and some different dreams about you know what we might put in this orchard. Um, it's going to be planted, uh, the center portion we planted on a sort of a standard size rootstock, almost, uh, it'll be almost full size, and the outer side, uh, the outer portions will be on a, sort of a more dwarfing. But it's sort of worth pointing out that these days, um, pretty much all commercial orchards plant on very dwarfing rootstock, um, very close together, very trellised. You know, to see it, you wouldn't recognize it. You know, it looks more like a vineyard sometimes than an apple orchard, and so we're trying to recreate sort of the orchard of the past. Um, it's a sacrifice of a bit of, you know, space for varieties, but to gain something of an aesthetic. Yes, and you can see on around the pictures around the outside that we plan to make this fairly interactive. So when visitors come to see the orchard, they'll see all the different styles and different things. We want to make it so, you know, there are so many different ways to grow apples. There isn't just one, and there might be a way that you would find more advantageous to be at your site. So if you can see how it's done, it might give you the inspiration and perhaps the courage to take the plunge and plant an apple and see what you can do with it. Absolutely, well, and here we're all about everyone having apples. So um, I'll let Dan tell you a little bit about <clears throat> apples. Well, apple varieties are typically not propagated from seed. Many people write to us and say, well, I have this wonderful apple. Can I send you seeds of it if you want to keep it alive? Well, you can send us the seeds, but unfortunately when you plant those, or when we plant those, what comes up will likely not be true to the parent much at all. Many cases will be completely different. Of all the thousands of varieties I've worked with over the years, um, I only know of maybe six that are known to come true from seed to a point. Apples express themselves as genetically so different that when you plant a seedling of something that's been cross-pollinated, it will be whatever uh, resultant from um, that, co that cross. And so that's why there are literally so many thousands of varieties of apples because of that constant uh, 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 pollination by different varieties, uh, changing the genetics, and, uh, and there are so many possibilities out there. And if you're home gardeners, you're familiar with, you know, the process of hybridization. You know, if you buy tomatoes that are hybrids and you were to try and save your seed and plant them, they wouldn't look like the tomatoes that you purchased. Uh, it's the same with apples, since most are largely self-infertile. They pretty much have to cross with each other, thereby producing a hybrid. And in addition to that, uh, they're extreme heterozygotes, which means they mix up their genetics like crazy when they do that. And so that's why you don't get, you know, like with a tomato hybrid, you don't get the best of both parents. What you get is something that's just a, a jumble, you know, and so it's, it's really, they say, you know, sort of one in 10,000 that you might get a really excellent apple, you know, yeah. uh, out of that. So centuries ago, the early Greeks and Romans noticed that in nature sometimes when branches rubbed together in a forest, they sometimes grew together. And so they knew there was a vital life force that kept these things uh, growing. So it... That is sort of the rough idea where grafting came about. And so to be able to propagate a tree and keep it true to itself, you have to vegetatively propagate it by various methods. Grafting is the one that we choose, and that will keep that tree alive uh, for generations. We have apples currently available in the markets that have been around since the 1200s, simply for the fact that they've been uh, grafted um, century after century to keep these trees alive. And that says something about the type of variety that they are and the quality of the apple. And so at this point, um, it's worth saying that usually, you know, so with grafting, so we're, we're grafting a variety that we like to create a clone of it. Um, and usually when we graft, uh, you know, we will choose a rootstock chosen for its properties and a scion or top stock chosen for its fruits. Um, so, you know, for beyond just preserving a variety, grafting provides sort of the benefit of uh, dwarfing ability. So there are rootstocks that offer you pretty much 
anything from 25% or 20% of a full size tree to full size in sort of increments of 20%. So you can really you have a lot of control over the size of your final tree. Um, the, small, the more dwarfing the rootstock, the earlier you'll get fruiting. So, you know, if a seedling tree was going to fruit in 10 years, on a very dwarfing rootstock, you might get fruits in two years. Um, there are also, you know, cold tolerance, disease resistance, and adaptation to soils that are benefits of different rootstocks. Somewhat of the downside to grafting onto dwarfing stock is the dwarfer the stock, generally the shorter live the tree will be. The older trees that were planted on seedling stock, or meaning full size, those trees have the ability to be alive for 100 to 150 years easily. Pears, even over 200 years. But on true dwarfing tr stock, these trees will not likely be around much after about 25 to 30 years. Um, intermediate size is certainly longer than that, but the true dwarfing will be a compromise on lifespan. If you are looking to get a tree into production quickly, by going to a dwarfing stock that will add uh, time and uh, make your fruit marketable faster. Excellent. So these are some of the tools um, as we get into talking about grafting itself uh, that you would need for that process. And I'll let Dan walk you through this because he has the most experience by far. We realized the other day when we were grafting trees in the basement for the new orchard that he's been grafting apple trees longer than I've been alive. So uh, I think I'll just get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, these are some of the typical tools that we use for grafting. Mostly what you need to have is a good sharp knife. Uh, grafting knives are a little bit different than average pocket knives. I mean, certainly it has a sharp blade, but it is ground like a chisel, meaning it has flat on one side and beveled on the other. That allows you, when you pull your knife through the, the material that you're cutting, that it allows you to cut on a flatter plane, and that just makes it easier. So grafting knives um, can be purchased as grafting knives, or you can, you can re-hone a regular knife to cut it the way uh, you need to. You can make them left or right-handed, of course. It does make a little difference. So besides the grafting knife, it comes in different forms, is we have a pruning shears to trim the stock that we need to do. We have a rubber band that is uh, used to tie the stock together once it's been grafted. And then, of course, we have labels to keep track of the names of the varieties, a good marker that's uh, hopefully fairly indelible and keeps, um, keeps out there in the sunlight to mark what it is that you grafted. And to seal the graft union once the rubber band's been put on it, we, uh, we like to use a product called parafilm. It's a waxy sheet, basically, that uh, is used normally to seal test tubes, but it works great for wrapping around the rubber band portion of the rut and uh, helps to seal the graft union from drying out. Um, I would just like to take a moment uh, to mention that there is a question and answer box at the bottom right of your screen. Um, we do see questions and I think we'll just try and answer them at the end because it's a little bit tricky to type and talk. So uh, do please give us your questions, but uh, we'll probably just cover most of it at the end. Um, and maybe, or if we do see it, maybe we'll try and work it into what we're talking about. Right. So the rubber bands that uh, showing the picture there of um, are made. Uh, they're basically it's a good rubber band. You can use uh, a regular rubber band that you have maybe around the house. Being a little wider is what you're looking for. These are made so when they are exposed to sunlight for a longer period of time, they do get brittle and eventually will come off the tree, which is what we need to have done. Once you graft your tree, you're going to put it in your refrigerator, keep it someplace cold for a while, and then once you plant it outside, after a month or two, it needs to come off. So these type of rubber bands typically will degrade in sunlight and then will, will come off the tree. And they're, just to mention, they're, they're sold as grafting strips or grafting bands um, from places like A.M. Leonard or you know, other you know, sort of tree supply companies. Um, you can also purchase grafting knives from places like that and various types of labels. Um, Sometimes, you know, we use sort of a, a waterproof uh, paper that we write on with a Sharpie. It's important to use the thick Sharpies for whatever reason. The really uh, small point Sharpies fade in the sunlight much faster uh, than you would expect. Um, there's also uh, double-sided aluminum tags, which uh, work really, before. They work really well. You can write with a ballpoint pen, and that impresses into the uh, into the aluminum, and it allows you to be able to read it long after, the, uh, after it may otherwise faded. They work really quite well, but they are um, uh, fragile to a point. I had one year a raccoon came and chewed a lot of them up into small balls and uh, made them pretty much unreadable with the teeth marks. So sometimes it's a good idea to, once you label a tree, write it down somewhere else to keep track of it. He still thinks it was a raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> This is a series of grafting knives of different styles and kinds. 
The one on your far right, the Felco unit, is a budding knife as well as a grafting knife as it has a distinctive little uh, bump out on the back side of the blade at quite at the top. Budding is a different process by which you will put, uh, we'll show you a little bit later how that works. It is done typically in the later summer uh, from probably mid to late July through August. Uh, it's a different process than the whip and tongue, but then um, we'll talk about that later. The other knife next to it is a heavier uh, type of grafting knife, has a heavy wood handle to it, which is real easy to pull through larger thick stock. The knife in the center is the one I use most of the time. Uh, it has a very stiff blade and uh, cuts quite well. The one next to it on its left is a altered steak knife I found at a thrift shop. I reground it, it cost me 25 cents. And on the other side is a chip carving knife that I found works quite well as, as also, but it's also about $30. So you have a choice of different knives and what you want to pay for them. So yeah, this, this sort of shows the range of what you can use. Um, I think Dan would agree that the most important point is that it's very sharp. Um, that's, that's, that'll make your life a whole lot easier when you try and make some of the cuts that we're about to show you. All right, this is a typical uh, piece of sign wood. It will show you in the center. Um, you can see there's a slight discoloration uh, which is closest to you. It's slightly lighter gray going off to your left and darker colored off to your right. This shows the distinction of where last year's growth, meaning the one on the left, versus uh, or two years growth versus last year's growth, which is the lighter dark colored, uh, or I should say the darker colored that uh, goes off in the distance there. So what we like to select for cyan wood, which is the variety of apple we want to put on your wood, is what was last year's growth, usually the fresher, darker. The reason being is that the cambium layer, which is the essential part of what we are trying to bind together, is a little thicker on new wood. It's only two cells thick, but this is the critical point of trying to meld these two together to get, uh, get it to grow. And so if, by selecting water sprouts, which are typically easy to find, the suckers that grow straight out of pruning cuts, um, try to select those if possible because you'll find it works much easier. Um, one more point is that uh, the sort of confusion between this year and last year's growth comes in because you will be selecting your, or cutting your scions during the dormant season, which would be, you know, typically February, March, you know, before, before the trees have a chance to leaf out, before the buds break in the winter. Um, so it'll be, these will be, the wood that you're selecting is the wood that, you know, that finished growing last year. And you can see on your screen sort of the, the closest point to you, uh, a lot of little scars. And that's where the leaves fell away from when the bud broke the previous year. And so that's a real telltale sign of, you know, which is the previous year's growth. Um, anything that's got spurs coming out of it is older than one year. You know, people are always asking, you know, is, you know, what, what, what am I looking for? So, you know, it's usually fairly straight. Um, your, your goal is to get something that's probably pencil thick and about six to eight inches long, uh, longer if you can. But it really, it just, it's important that it's the previous year's growth. Yeah, this year, um, uh, spring has come out quite a bit earlier than usual, and so people were rushed to be able to get cuttings of, of the different sign woods they've needed. Um, if it has leafed out or you're starting to see uh, green tip on your end of your buds, it generally is too late to try to do grafting for this spring. You'll probably need to wait till summer when you can do bud grafting. Yeah, we had, a, we had a question from John before it started, and, and that's sort of to address that, that, you know, now that the leaves are out, uh, the next opportunity is for bud grafting in the summer. The problem is that once the buds have broken, you're going to try and make this graft, and essentially the scion portion will suck itself dry before it has a chance to heal and connect itself to the root. And so there's, no, there's just not that opportunity right now once things are in full growing mode. Now, once in a while you might find a bud or a leaf uh, shoot that's come out a little bit, and there may be some dormant buds behind it. You might be able to be lucky and try those, but typically that's fairly problematic. I probably wouldn't suggest it. It is kind of difficult. Uh, so the most desirable quality of rootstock, uh, just to answer your question, is uh, that it would be ideally about six to eight inches long, uh, that it's from the previous season's growth, and that it's about pencil thick. Um, you know, you're, you're going to end up trying to match it to these rootstock portions uh, that we'll show you right about now. Okay. When you buy rootstocks, these are commercially uh, purchased rootstocks from Nursery in Oregon. Uh, this is a variety called M7. Um, you can see there's slightly different rooting uh, structure there. It is not a terribly uh, heavily rooted tree. At the lower far right corner, you can see where the original tree was pruned off of the mother plant. These were done by a process called stooling. 
where they'll pack a soft, uh, wet material around the base of the tree and where all the bud eyes it will produce shoots and then they'll typically form roots. And those are pruned off the mother plant and these are the trees that you buy. When you buy quantities, typically you can buy them in a very particular calipered size, meaning a fairly specific diameter. So it allows you to be able to select um, the kind of uh, sign wood that you need to match the size of the rootstock. So they come in many different sizes from 1 8 inch to probably uh, close to half inch thick, um, typically in 16th inch graduations. And so it allows us to be able to um, work with these quite readily. We typically will buy two different sizes. The one on the bottom is a 3 16 caliper versus the one on the top being about a quarter inch caliper. And it does make a uh, difference. You can always graft smaller cyan wood onto larger rootstock, but you really can't graft large cyan wood onto small rootstock. It just doesn't work terribly well. It's true. It comes to matching the cambium. Uh, one thing that comes from what Dan was talking about stooling in nursery beds is that the rootstocks themselves are also clonally propagated. So uh, they're you know they're a cutting from a specific tree that is then you know sends up shoots and then those shoots you know are encouraged to produce roots and then those shoots are cut off. So you're really attaching a clone to a clone, and that gives you the most control over uh, over your end result, which is you know, sort of the, the main goal for, you know, nursery production these days. Um, but also, you know, for your average home, you know, backyard gardener, if you only have a certain amount of space in your backyard, you need to be able to fit something in there. And so uh, being able to choose your rootstock uh, and have a very known property for it is important. Typically, when you uh, purchase rootstock from a company, it's a good thing to if to make sure that you have them ordered before the end of the year, as they typically sell yeah. out quite quickly. We uh, have found in the last couple of years that supplies have been quite tight. And so, but at least get to thinking by the end of the year after you picked your last apple that you maybe need to start thinking about ordering rootstock for the next year. Yeah, it does. It's definitely you know November is not too early to be thinking about ordering rootstock. Um, I know people want to know. So Rain Tree Nursery in Washington is somewhere that we or that you could get um, low quantities of stuff. They sell pretty much by the piece um, with a price break at like twenty five. Uh, Cummins Nursery in New York State is another place that you can get rootstock in low quantities. You know, we tend to order hundreds of rootstock because we're trying to graft a lot of things, but, and you get a, it's significantly cheaper, but you know, if you only want five, you don't need the extra 95. So uh, Cummins and uh, Rain Tree are good places for, you know, uh, hobbyists to get stuff. Or if you can find a lot of people to go in together, you can get a fairly good deal on 100 rootstocks from somewhere like uh, Trico or Willamette or Copenhagen. Yeah, we've ordered from those, all of those probably in the past. And they've been all very reliable and uh, uh, good material, definitely good material. All right. So this this graphic here shows a little bit, you know, sort of what you could expect. You know, um, a standard size tree would be, you know, a seedling tree. And uh, the reason, you know, part of the reason we graft is because we want these specific varieties. We want clones of them. Um, and... Uh, they don't, hardwood apple cuttings just don't tend to root very well. I mean, despite that sort of stooling idea, the rootstocks are sort of chosen for that as well. So if you want a standard sized tree, you'd still graft onto a seedling rootstock or, you know, something like a, we, we do a lot of M111 in our new orchard, which is sort of three quarters of full size. But, you know, this shows you that you can get this sort of gradation of sizing um, so that, you know, you can have a, you know, a large tree if you have a lot of land, you know, if you have just a small backyard, a semi-dwarf tree, you know, an M7 or something like that would work pretty well. Um, coming down to very dwarfing sizes where you can grow them in pots, you know, it's a, uh, it's all very practical. I mean, you can have an apple pretty much anywhere as long as, you know, your climate permits it. Sure. You can always produce your own rootstocks if you want. Just save the seeds of the apples you've been eating and just plant them out in the fall and uh, in spring they'll typically sprout and send up little shoots and after a year or so you can graft onto those. They will be seedling trees, however, and will be full size, but at least you can have a root that you can plant onto rather than having to purchase one. So moving on, so the, the whip and tongue graft is uh, the bench sort of bench grafting is usually what's done in the dormant season and that usually is the whip and tongue graft and the approach graft, both of which we'll show you, uh, which are different from the bud graft, which we'll also talk about, but that's a, a summer process. So let Dan talk you through the, the motions of this. All right. Above, you'll see the rootstock that we're going to be using. That is an M7 rootstock. And I selected a piece of sign wood that you see down below it of about the same diameter. We try to match those in this case just to make things a little bit easier to graft. Let's go on to the next. So this is what we're looking for. That area that you see highlighted is the cambium layer. 
Um, that is the active growing part of the tree and that's what we need to try to align as closely as possible. And the diameter of that particular cutting was about a quarter inch. So the length of the cut is about three quarters to an inch long. Typically, it's not a hard and fast rule of thumb, but you will try to make a cut as long as about four times the diameter of what it is that you're cutting in this case. Yeah, and so this, this picture is a really good picture of the cambium, which this is the key to it all. So you're matching cambium, you're not matching wood. So, you know, we, we just did a whole series of grafting classes this weekend. You know, I've gone through this process myself and, you know, it's, it's tempting to sort of line stuff up and say, well, that's pretty close, but really, you know, there's just this little smile of green around the outside, you know, of where the cuts. And the problem is that that's what you're missing is exactly what you need at that point, you know, so getting this green cambium layer matched up is the key to success. So this is the start of what we're trying to do. Typically, you will always cut your cyan wood first, so you know how large of a, a, a lips that you need to make. So you place your knife. I like to hold mine close to me like that. I apply my thumb behind it to allow me to push into the, the, the stock into the knife and allows me to control the cut quite nicely. I do have a bandage on my finger, not because I had a cut at that particular time, but it does protect my thumb from the knife pushing against it after hundreds of grafts sometimes some days. It, uh, my thumb does get a little frazzled. So this is the end of the first cut on the cyan wood. You can see how long it is versus how wide it is. And you can see that tiny green layer just inside the outer bark um, highlighted there. So now what we need to do is find a spot on the rootstock that is about the same diameter. And then we'll pick up the rootstock and we'll make a matching cut on that, which we'll see next. Uh, just a clarifying point for Heidi, uh, we are grafting scions onto rootstock. So the scion variety is the apple variety that you want. It's chosen for its fruits. Uh, the rootstock variety is also a clonal variety, but it's chosen for its size controlling characteristics, you know, and some of those other traits they, you know, some have disease resistances uh, that you might choose them for. So yeah, we are, we're grafting scions to rootstock in this. So here I found a spot that looks like a pretty good match as far as diameter. And uh, from that point on, I will make my, make my next cut. All right. I made the first cut in the sign wood, which is laying on the ground below me. And the first cut wasn't quite up to size, so I have to retrim it just a little bit. So I'll hold it in my hand and pull it, uh, the knife through it again to get the right size. And here I'm showing that I've got the two just about exactly the, the same length, um, the same thickness. Now, that part is, you could put those two together and it would be called a whip graft. Well, it is inherently unstable. It doesn't hold together terribly well. So that being said, we do now the second portion of it called the tongue. So we first cut the whip, which is the elongated oval, and now we make a back cut starting about a third of the way from the far tip, the part that's been cut off, you take your knife, set the blade flat against the uh, wood, and start to cut backwards um, toward, uh, toward the end of it. Um, about, like I said, starting about a third of the way and cutting back also another third of the way. The purpose of this is then to cut the same thing on the rootstock and then intertwine the two, uh, knit them together, and it forms a very strong joint. And it also increases the contact amount of the cambium layer also. In, uh, in my, my time learning this, I've found that it's very helpful to, you know, to keep the knife sort of, you know, real, real steady and then sort of wiggle it back and forth and work it in there. Uh, it reduces the chance that, you know, since you already have a slanted cut, it reduces the chances of really just, you know, sliding off into your finger. Um, it also gives you more control. And you really want to keep that back cut, you know, kind of thin. If you go straight for the center of your of your material, uh, you'll end up when you put them together, which you'll see, it kind of pushes both of the ends out. So trying to keep it, you know, sort of sort of towards the surface. Right. By keeping your thumb directly behind the, the stock and against the knife, it allows you to control the pressure you put on it and cuts in quite easily, actually. And it's very, very, very safe. So that's as far as I cut in for the for the tongue part of it. And then you can see I've got uh, a tongue cut on both pieces, and now I'm going to interlock the two of them together. You see, you're starting to push those two in. It kind of opens it up a little bit and push, push it a little bit farther. And then here's the point where the two of them are matched up. And at this point, we need to tie it together. We need to compress it with a rubber band to pull those surfaces together. That's the key of making this the, truly work. It's quite a tight joint in the center of it. 
but as it gets farther and farther outside, you can see the wood spreads away a little bit and the rubber band will compress it and pull it back together. And here you can see where I've wound it up. You twist and turn and pulling, putting a little tension on it all the time. Um, the trick is how tight do you mean? Well, as long as there's some tension on it, that's what you need to have to compress it, whatever it kind of takes. But you don't really want to wind it too tight. You may kind of girdle the, the stock, but put tension on it. Roll it in between your fingers until you wind up the whole graft union underneath the rubber band. And then to tie it off, you take it, wrap it around your thumb, then on the next loop around, wrap it underneath your thumb. And at this point then, you can roll that loop off onto that uh, piece that I'm holding in there in my right hand, and it'll be uh, tied. It's quite, quite a little trick, but it works quite well. The next slide will show that. I can promise you that's the hardest part. It took me a year to learn that. There you can see I pulled it under, and uh, go ahead again, and now it's tied. You can see that little bit of a loop is caught under there, and it's uh, held on real well. And that's it. That is your graft. Now, the thing is, your rootstock cannot support a lot of growth. Uh, typically, we select two to three, uh, no more than four buds um, after the graft union because the rootstock cannot support it. Um, it has some energies within it, but it needs time for it to heal, and by leaving a long look growth on it, it would be stressful. So we take that off down to just a couple of buds and trim it with a shears straight off, typically about a quarter inch above where the bud is, um, so it typically will dry back um, a little bit. Um, if you're concerned about the end of it being uh, open and dry, you can always put a dot of Elmer's glue on the tip, and that uh, seals it up quite nicely and there's your completed graft. Now the only thing we do after this point is certainly we like to make sure we tag the trees. This shows the variety that we put onto the tree and also the rootstock that we used. Uh, the one sort of step that's missing here is that we do usually use this stretchy parafilm that we showed at the beginning. Um, it'll be in the next portion, but uh, we would wrap over top of that rubber band with a stretchy parafilm just to seal in the moisture even more. Um, you know, people did make successful grafts well before parafilm and everything else. They moved, you, know, you can dip stuff into wax, but uh, we find that that works really easily. And you can buy, if you can't find parafilm, which is a sort of a lab supply, uh, they do sell sort of a grafting, uh, like wax tape, you know, uh, that works for the same sort of purpose. They also make blocks of grafting wax, which is sort of problematical to put on. We find it extremely sticky and it sticks to everything under the sun. Another way that works quite well, if you actually had some paraffin wax that you could melt, just get it barely melted and you can dip your entire graft union, not the root part of it, but the top down to the graft union in the wax just quickly and that'll seal it up wonderfully and it's quite inexpensive. So the, the side approach whip and tongue graft is used when you can't match those, those scions and rootstocks quite so perfectly as Dan did in the previous example. And like he mentioned, uh, you, can, so you, can always, you can always graft something smaller to something larger, but not something larger to smaller. And since the scion is the determining quality, that's, that's what can never be larger. Because if it was larger, if you think about it, your cambium layer would never meet on the rootstock. So this side approach graft is really good. We do this a lot. Um, you know, if you have a, a tree that's not putting out much growth, uh, you're trying to rescue some tree, you know, that's you know, it's old or it's its last couple twigs or something that you managed to get, like this might be what you're sort of, you find yourself trying. Yeah, we actually find this um, most of the time in the orchard. We're getting very small cuttings and putting on a little bit larger rootstock. So this is a typical example. I'm holding the rootstock in my right hand, which is on the left side of your screen, and the sign with it I'm going to put onto it is the diameter that you see there. Quite a bit difference. But it's not hard to do at all. It's actually quite simple. May, actually, it's almost easier than doing the uh, all the way through the, the stock and the, and, the, and the sign wood. So you take your knife. Um, I'm holding the sign wood in my hand so I can make a uh, cut all the way through it. And you can see the length of it. It's uh, a little bit longer than four times the diameter, but you get the idea that it should be about, the, about, about a three quarters to an inch long either way. Now, I hold that sign wood in my hand and then I also hold the rootstock and then I set my knife on top of it and I cut just deep enough to start making uh, it'll show like an ellipse as well and the deeper you cut into a circle like that the, the wider it'll get so by cutting shallow it's narrow when you cut deeper it gets wider so you can actually fit the profile of the sign wood quite well with the tip of the knife as you can see there I've got two of them just about the same size Right, and so at the point at which you're cutting this, uh, this secondary cut into the rootstock, 
you'll already you'll you sort of choose where you want your graft union on your rootstock, and typically you want that to be about you know five six inches above you know the soil line where the roots were in the nursery. That way, uh, when you plant it out, um, it, it'll be well above but not too high. The the more rootstock that's exposed above ground level increases the dwarfing qualities of that stock. And additionally, the other converse side of it is that if you were to plant your graft union below the ground, the cyan would eventually send out roots and then you would get a full-size tree. You would lose any dwarfing qualities, which becomes quite problematic if you hadn't planned on having, you know, if you were planning on having a 10-foot tree and now you have a 30-foot tree. So, you know, snip it, you make a snip off with the uh, pruners right where you want your graft and then you make that second cut Dan was just talking about. Typically with the grafting classes we do, we try to tell them to try to match the size of the cyan wood with the rootstock. And invariably then, when they're doing that, they'll, they'll graft at the very far end of that whole rootstock. The rootstock, of course, has a full set of roots, but it has been pruned off the mother plant. It will be stressed, and it, a lot of times it dies back a small amount. So you really don't want to graft way high up in the rootstock, which can be upwards of two feet long above the ground line. So by cutting it back within a hand's breadth of what you could see is where it was originally planted, you have a better chance of it growing. Now, it's easy to tell where, it, uh, where the original uh, planting line was on that rootstock. Typically, the bark will be discolored. It'll be uh, lighter green where it was below ground and a darker color where it was above ground. So using that as a guide, spread your uh, thumb and four um, little finger apart as far as you can, and that's kind of the range about where you'd like to plant above the root. Um, we just got a question from Shannon about when the best time to graft is. So with this bench grafting technique that we're talking about, uh, typically it's late spring and it depends on where you are. You know, our, our climate up here in Northeast Iowa is uh, different than, you know, maybe Southern California. But uh, what your goal is, you know, once this graft is completed, you know, you collect your scions during the dormant season. Uh, you can hold those in the fridge, you know, in a Ziploc bag with some damp paper towels for quite some time uh, in the refrigerator. Um, and then you know, you can make your graphs. So once, you know, your graphs are completed, like the one Dan just showed before, and like this one will be, uh, you'll wrap it up, you'll keep something moist around the roots in the same way, you'll keep it in a plastic bag, and you'll want to put that in your refrigerator for about a month. And that, that sort of cool temperature gives the stock, uh, the cyan and the root stock, a chance to knit together. And at that point, you'll want to plant it outside. So, you know, what your goal is to basically have grafted a month before you want to plant outside. So you have a you have a large window, you know, just depending on your climate, but you know, you just you know, if you were to plant out in you know mid June, you know, somewhere and it's really hot, it's really stressful for a tree to be, you know, transported from, you know, that sort of extreme of an environment. So we just finished a lot of grafting. I mean we tend to do a lot of grafting this time of year, you know, so that gives us sort of a, a window to plant in early May or something like that, or late, you know, late April, early May, mid-May. I consider this time of uh, April is a little bit late on grafting. It's not that bad, but typically for me, it would be a little late. I like to start, um, oh, usually about mid-March to about mid-April, uh, mid and that works quite well. So, uh, we made the long cut in the uh, sign wood of, that, of the so, uh, stock there. Now we're going to take and do the back cut, just like we did as the other one. And you can see I set the knife blade on the stock, and, or on the sign wood, I should say, and we start to do that small little back cut. You don't have to make it terribly long, but you do need to make that. Okay, you can see that I've gotten in a little bit farther with it. And now we've uh, cut the other one, and uh, you can see I've matched the two of those together. I slipped it onto it. You can see a different angle, kind of what it looks like. It comes right out of the side of it, uh, and it works really quite well. And you bind it up the same way with a rubber strip to hold the two of them together. And there's a completed graft union right there. This is the parafilm product we were talking about. It's already been put on the tree, and as you can see, it envelops it quite nicely. It works really quite well. I know it looks bad, but we're not shills for the parafilm company. Uh, we use them for our test tubes, and it works great for grafting. Uh, it really is just a good stretchy material. And honestly, you know, we, we buy it in like 100 foot rolls or something. So I don't know if, you know, for your average home person that this is what you would end up using. But, you know, some sort of, you know, grafting, stretchy grafting wax tape or, you know, something like that works really well. Yeah. You could do whatever you want, but we find it works quite well for us. If it, it is just probably not cost effective to buy a large roll just to do a few grafts with. Certainly just dip it in some paraffin wax and it, you'd certainly be money ahead. So, so this they, shows your, uh, your whole tree. As you can see, it's not terribly large. But that will be a, a that will grow to be a nice sized tree in about five years. 
Yeah, so at this point, this tree, um, you know, and any others could be put in, you know, basically a garbage bag with some, usually, you know, either moist paper towels, damp peat moss, damp sawdust, you know, whatever you have around the roots, uh, and, you know, just sort of tied up so that it keeps a humid environment inside there and stuck in the refrigerator for about a month, you know, before it be being planted out. Um, one, one important point with that is that uh, while you have, you know, baby trees in the refrigerator, it's a good idea not to have apples in the refrigerator. Uh, when, as apples ripen, they release ethylene gas, which is the same gas that causes buds to break. So, I mean, I've never seen it happen, but I've read that basically the idea is that if you had a bunch of apples in there, you might be, you know, causing your trees to come out of dormancy too soon, and they could grow themselves to death in your refrigerator before they had a chance. So, which is not terribly ideal. No. <laughs> no. We like to avoid that. So definitely put them in a bag with something to keep to keep the roots damp. Forget about them for about a month, and then when it's fit to plant outside, then you can take your trees and plant them out. Um, if you were to put them in a place uh, like a root cellar where it's kind of cold, it has to stay cold if possible because otherwise the trees may come out of dormancy while they're down in your basement. I had that happen one year where a lot of trees started leafing, and if that's the case, don't plant them immediately outside. That's not the thing to do. Take them outside, put them on the north side of your house where they can acclimate themselves both to the temperature and a little bit of light. And then when the leaves start to green up, that's a good time that you can plant them out. Otherwise, you would uh, sunburn the leaves right off and you may kill the tree. Sound advice. So we'll talk a little bit about bud grafting. Um, this is a technique that you would do in the summer months. It's uh, typically around here, it's uh, end of July, uh, beginning of August, maybe last week of July, last two weeks of July. It, it all depends on two things, uh, when the sap is flowing and when the buds are ready. So uh, what we'd be looking for is that when you make a cut into the tree for this bud grafting, you need the bark to sort of slip away. And so there's a point in the summertime when when you make that cut, the cambium layer will just slide off like real easy, like it doesn't take any effort. And so you're looking for that to be the case. And also you're looking for the buds to be mature at the same time. And so looking at the current year's growth, uh, you'll see, you know, at this point in the summer, You'll, you'll look at the base of the petiole of each leaf and you'll see a bud and it may be tiny, which would be kind of, you know, which is, there are different sizes of buds, but a very small bud is probably immature, but a, a large, you're looking for sort of a large, plump, brown, reddish brown bud. And that's gonna be, you know, a mature bud. Um, and when you, when you once you hit that point, uh, when the sap is flowing and the buds are mature, then you're gonna collect a cyan stick, you know, exactly as you would in the dormant season, you know, taking that, this current year's growth, um, and then you're going to cut all of the, the leaves off down to the petiole, uh, as you can see sort of in this graphic. Yeah, you see the leaf stalks sticking out there and the buds behind it. Many times the buds aren't near that large uh, or that obvious, but they are behind there. If you were to pull the leaf stalk away, you will see the bud that will be next year's growth. By leaving the stem on there, it allows it to be used as a handle, which makes it easier to, to work with when you're trying to do the graft. So this, this little series of uh, animation will show you um, what you're going to do is you're going to cut from up underneath the bud, sort of a shallow cut, um, and then you're going to come back and you're just going to score the bark across the top in this cut so that then when you peel off the bud, because the bark is slipping, you're just going to peel off that top cambium bark layer, leaving behind all of the wood. And so you have that nice sort of uh, petiole handle to hold on to that Dan was talking about. Yeah, by holding on to that, it allows you to use that as the surface and not touching the underside of it, which oils from your skin can maybe contaminate it and cause it not to bind as good as it could later on. So then you're going to take your, this is, this is your rootstock, um, which, you know, can be growing or not. You know, if you have rootstock, say that, you know, you tried to bench graft in the winter time and you planted them out and your, your graft didn't take, but you left the rootstock to grow, you could use that rootstock, you know, so you can imagine that there are leafy green leaves on the top of this, uh, if you like. Um, and so you're going to make this T cut. And so typically, I'll make the cut across the top. It's Once again, it's just through the bark. It's almost just a little rock through the bark with the knife, uh, and then cut back up towards the top. Um, it's just, it's, you know, it's real nice and easy motion. You make that T. And then those knives that Dan showed you at the beginning, where one of them had the bump at the end, you can use that bump to sort of, you know, push the bark to the side a little bit. It's really easy to sort of peel it away. If you don't have one, find a butter knife. It works just as well. And, you know, and as you get more skilled, even the tip of a normal knife will work. It's just that you might find that the sharpness of that tends to, you know, sort of fray and cut into the, bar or into the bark that you're trying to move more yeah. than you'd like. And it may damage the cambium layer, which you try to avoid. But so once you have it, you know, once you have your bark uh, like this, you know, uh, basically just insert your bud, you know, sort of press it down. It'll slide right into place. 
uh, close the bark over the top and then wrap it up with a rubber band um, just as easy as you please same as same as the other stuff we've done and yeah with the one sort of you know caveat being that you would like to leave the bud exposed um, you know it won't the tree won't grow that season, so it, it's not as critical as with bench grafting, but, you know, it's something that's nice to do. One telltale they say is if the leaf stalk is left on the tree and uh, on the bud graft, and if it stays green, it shows that it's likely taken. If it dries up and drops off, it means it maybe hasn't. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it may be something you want to look for if you do that. This is definitely true. Um, I would say don't get if you try bud grafting and you know so you you'll have bud grafted it and you'll you'll it's either plant it out already or you'll plant it out uh, you're gonna leave it through that growing season and then early spring about now you're gonna come back and you're gonna cut everything off above your one grafted bud and then you know it's gonna have a chance to grow and I'd say don't don't give on your up on your bud grafts too quickly I uh, I pulled one up that looked you know like it had died the other day and when I you know, shucked back the bark with my knife, I found that the bud was still green, which meant that eventually it would have grown. The beauty of bud grafting is that you can put several buds up and down a root like that. You don't have to have just one. Whip and tongue is strictly a one-shot deal, whereas bud grafting, you've got a couple of choices, which gives you a little bit of uh, latitude as far as being able to put a couple on just for safety, and you're likely to get one or all of them taken. It's just that easy. And so this is showing uh, some bud grafts I did last fall uh, after they've had a time to heal. I've, so they've, I've made them and then I've wrapped them and then I've taken the rubber band off. And so they're all potted up and you can see in the background there's you know, sort of some leaves at the top. Um, these are ready to be planted out into a nursery patch, which I did. And so this spring I've just come along and cut that bud you know, off, you know, maybe you know, a quarter inch, half inch above the bud. Typically, most of the uh, trees, uh, fruit trees that you find at your lar local garden center are budded trees. That is what most commercial nurseries do. You can always tell a budded tree because um, there will be the root that comes out of the pot, and then where the bud shoot grows out, and then the tree above it is cut off, uh, it has that telltale crook to it. Um, so that always tells you that it's a budded tree, whereas the whip and tongue method is more of a straight line method, and it's a little harder to detect where that graft union is. So uh, we'd like to we'd like to point you towards a couple of resources. Um, the Seed Savers Exchange Forum is actually a, a good resource. People you know swap advice on gardening and other things. Um, our website will have more and more information. This webinar will be posted once it's recorded. Uh, I tend to go uh, to the Corn University of Cornell, uh, Apple. Uh, they do they're the USDA Geneva Research Station there has a lot of information, so the uh, web address you see, the fruit.cornell.edu, has a lot of information about growing apple trees. Uh, the next link down is a video that Dan did a couple years ago showing a lot of the, basically the techniques you just saw, but in a video on how to graft. Um, so there, there, we'd like to answer some of the questions that you've posted, which have just been uh, too hard for me to try and keep up with, you know, sort of back and forth. Um, one of them was actually, you know, so where to get cyan wood. Um, there are, in the same way that there are a lot of nurseries that do rootstocks, there are nurseries that specialize in various cyan woods. We got some from Maple Valley this year. They're a nursery that does a lot of heirloom varieties. Um, There's more than a few. Uh, Kelly's Nurseries out of uh, Virginia, Big Stone Gap, Virginia, uh, has cyan wood available of uh, hundreds and hundreds of kinds. So there are a lot of resources out there. If you have a, a favorite tree that you like, you can get a cutting from that. If you have a friend that has a tree that uh, you find uh, is a great apple, you can get cuttings from that. And basically they cost you nothing. Otherwise, typically cyan wood is purchased for about $3 to $3.50, give or take, uh, for about a pencil size stick, which you can do at least four trees with. All you need is a couple of buds per tree. Yeah, oh, one other actually really excellent resource is the Seed Savers yearbook. Um, it's sort of a, a plug, uh, I believe very much in the yearbook. We So we offered last year 130 varieties of apples through that yearbook and we hope to offer more and more as we work on this new orchard project and have you know new and healthy trees. Um, but you know through our other members there were 500 varieties of apples offered. You know typically like Dan's saying and I think it's five dollars, but you know, usually you get a couple of sticks, and you get access to stuff that you really can't get anywhere else. Um, but yeah, we hope we hope that this has been, uh, you know, uh, an informative informative session, and that that you'll have some success grafting trees. Well, Colin, it's time to break out the cider. <laughs> I would suppose so, Dan. Thank you all. <laughs> good night and good luck. <laughs>